congratulations on, on this trial. I think it's a real ground. Right. Well, it's quite fitting that it followed John because the Unicorn Foundation has been instrumental in providing the funding to support this trial. And as many members uh, in this room here who have participated in the trial design and in contribution to patients and will be a part of the, the team in, in writing up the results. So they're my disclosures. So I won't go over the background. It's suffice to say that this idea, actually I might go over to where the concept first came about. This study was conceived back in 2013 and Shell, I think we, with Harvey, presented it at a meeting, um, at, a, at an ENETS meeting not long after that, um, seeking your uh, uh, your uh, con your expertise as to whether you think it was a, a, a study that would would have legs. At that stage, there were no randomised control data on PRT or CAPTEM chemotherapy. In fact, the CAPTEM data was actually retrospective, so there was no prospective data. Of course, now we live in an era where we have randomised trial data from the NETA-1, and as people have said before, we expected it would work, but we still needed to see it. The question then is now, how does our study conceived so far back then, by the way, the iterations changed a bit after 2013, fit in the context of what we now know with NETA-1, and is it still relevant? And I'll explain that to you in a minute. So we changed the design from, a initially, from the initial concept to this. A two-arm, parallel group phase two study uh, investigating two cohorts of patients. The first cohort was actually patients with um, PNETs, low to intermediate grade, G12. And the second cohort, mid-gut nets, M-nets. And what we're effectively looking at was the activity of the combination of PRT with the CAP-10 protocol, extending the phase two single arm study results that um, Harvey and Phil uh, Karen Lowell had done in their previously reported study. We had a two to one randomization, so patients were more likely to get the experimental therapy than the control arm, and I'll show you which were the control arms were. And we had a stratification there based on a priori expected um, factors that might influence the outcome. The study actually took a while to start because we, we, we were waiting on funding. It started in November 2015, initially um, at uh, WA and with us at North Shore. This is how we received the funding. As you can see, Unicorn was instrumental. Um, in, um, and um, because of failure to secure uh, NHMRC and other funding, we amended the design um, to, uh, in terms of the size of the population from 165, where we had a, um, a different statistical plan to a more exploratory 72 patient design and revised the statistical plan around getting some meaningful data around that. Um, and currently we're enrolling. Um, we're uh, expected to, we were expected when we started that we'd finish by December 2018, but I think we'll finish by uh, June this year. Um, the follow-up period we revised, originally it was two years for the mid-gut nets. We amended that uh, to 15 months for mid-gut nets and 12 months for P-nets based on the observation of when we expected to hit the um, um, the meet the progression rate based on the publication of the data. Um, and so this is the actual design. Um, the red is the size of the populations in each group. The experimental arms in the middle, PRT, CAPTEM, and on the right and other side are what's the control arm. So in the in the uh, PRT arm, um, in the um, mid gut population, we actually have PRT alone, which fits now that we know what we know from NETA one. And in the um, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor arm, our control arm is the CAPTEM chemotherapy. So it's really looking at the relative activity of PRT and CAPTEM compared to what we now accept are reasonable standard controls. In the study design, we included a number of outcome measures. Um, st st uh, the primary outcome measure was progression-free survival, as you can see there, but a response rate, clinical benefit rate, which is a composite score, survival, safety, toxicity, quality of life, and resource utilization. Um, the study was designed not to be a comparative study, but to look at the outcome within the experimental arm and to have a reference arm in case our assumptions were found to be incorrect. Um, we were looking at G12 tumours. Everyone had to have a gallium-68 or creatide scan, and they had to have progressed um, uh, with less than or equal to two therapies or have significant untreated bulky disease that we felt it was justified. Uh, most of the patients that have entered, I think, have progressed. Um, in terms of exclusions, uh, um, other, other um, sites of origin were excluded, and prior chemotherapy was excluded. This was the treatment plan. Um, which fits in with the, our protocol for uh, outside of um, the study use of um, PRT, except for the fact that we don't use temozolomide in our protocol outside of uh, 
this study. In the translational research study, uh, we consent, the, the consent form allowed patients to consent for access to any of their archival uh, tissue, uh, paraffin embedded, um, three uh, sets of blood sets at baseline, at first assessment and at progression. And the intent was to look at a variety of correlative markers um, and we've only just had a te our first teleconference uh, Thursday morning to start making moves afoot at establishing a proper um, biomarker analysis plan. Um, um, and the first step is going to be looking at what tissue we have available so we can see what material we have. As far as blood sampling goes, I think we have a very high yield in terms of um, how much we've collected. Of course, we don't know yet how much tissue we'll have available. Ben's instrumental in, uh, in overseeing that. And a large component of the translational study will be to look at um, the uh, um, accuracy, I guess, of um, functional imaging, its impact on patient decision making, and, and comparison to standard resist reporting, including chromogranin A, uh, MGMT expression, KI67. Um, and uh, hadn't, we hadn't mentioned it, but with your discussion today about the, uh, the net um, test uh, shell, let's see what's, what samples are there, whether there's opportunity there. Funding is the thing that's limited us up until now. This is what we've achieved so far. The, re the, the, um, the revised um, target was 72. Three patients have been put on, subsequently found to be ineligible. So to make up for those, we're going to go for 75 patients. We now actually have 70 enrolled, which, are, which are, um, um, correlates to about just under eight patients per centre per annum compared to, and I just want to put that up there, that was a criticism one of the grants that we're, we're not likely to achieve accrual. Um, but you can see NETA-1 was achieved by, as a worldwide study across multiple centres in most places, they had less than two patients per centre uh, and crew. Very uh, grateful to uh, Andrew and uh, Dave Ransom over at um, uh, Fiona Stanley. We're next in line in terms of accrual. David Weil, Katrin started, and unfortunately we're still waiting on Peter Mack. So um, what have I learned about progress, uh, about this? Uh, it's been an interesting experience in terms of grant writing, an interesting experience in terms of perceptions and community knowledge in the general professional scientific community about NETS. Um, um, this is how the, the journey has been. And lo lots of failed grants. I said to Simone uh, Layden that I'd probably get her to write the next grant because she seems to have more success than I have. Um, so, but uh, we've got enough money to now complete the follow-up in the study, and uh, we, we're looking at enterprising ways of uh, looking at our endpoints. For example, setting up a PhD scholarship from Sydney Vital to look at the translational endpoints, and we'll look at perhaps other ways that we can secure funding for the biomarkers as well, because I think we've got a complete, a very strong clinical data set here with lots of information that we can compare and match uh, to our um, translational work. I felt this was a good um, a quote from Lord of the Rings. The certainty of death was more to me, not to the patient. The small chance of success was about success in getting the grant. What am I waiting for? Um, so, um, um, as I said, lots of lessons learnt about the community. So, there's a lot of education to our peer group, I guess. Um, I guess how people value uh, research in neuroendocrine tumours uh, differs strongly across the community. Uh, perhaps we hadn't, didn't articulate that as well in our grant applications. Generally, however, there's a strong push towards new technologies, new radioisotopes, genetic studies, rather than pragmatic studies. And I think that's going to be a problem perennially. It's not uh, nothing new about that. And we have to factor that in in our designs in our studies and how we uh, pitch our research. So are, is the study still valid today? I think the answer is yes. I hope Shell thinks similarly. We've demonstrated that monotherapy with PRT is uh, efficacious, but we still don't know whether the addition of chemotherapy makes that better. We don't know how it compares in the pancreatic neuroendocrine group against what would otherwise be an accepted standard. We've chosen CAPTAM, but the COMPETE study is comparing to Everolimus. Um, we're going to have a bunch of outcome measures that are important for which there are many outstanding questions in how they're used in the clinic. Whilst we use functional imaging, and we're quite happy doing it, those centres using PRT, when we sat down to do our COMNETS guidelines for follow-up, uh, including our NANETS group, they didn't want to include uh, nuclear imaging at all because there's no data on it. So we hopefully can contribute to some of the validity of our assumptions around the value of nuclear imaging in a controlled environment such as this. Um, this is our timelines. Last patient in, hopefully by June, uh, and five to go. So I'm going to uh, write to everyone and say, please, sorry to look for that last pancreas patient. 
The translational substudy protocols and analysis plans have started to commence. Then the first step is going to be tissue retrieval to see what we've got. We're going to uh, look at um, outlining a PhD scholarship for the composite scores for Sydney Vital and hopefully start to advertise that um, later this year for next year. First data look will probably be about 12 to 14 months from now. So the first report expected of any outcome of this study will probably be at the earliest ASCO GI or ENETS 2020, looking at timelines ahead. Um, and so uh, I've got to thank uh, those people in the room, the Unicorn Foundation, NHMRC, CTC, AGITG, all co-investigators and all the referring doctors uh, from uh, regional and other centres. Uh, so Stephen Begbie there has been a significant contributor as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get this done soon, despite the uh, difficulty. Thanks. It goes to the issue of bias and perhaps. So you've... We know that Peter Mack hasn't recruited anybody to this study. It's the largest net centre. So can you tell us a bit more? Is that just, is it bias? What, so know, one, how are we going to make progress yeah. in this disease? That, well, that's a good point. There's strong opinion in Peter Mack, not by everyone, but by some. Um, and uh, that opinion has dictated the choice of patient selection. Part of that opinion was that it's a toxic therapy. So one of the things I didn't mention was our uh, independent data safety monitoring board reviewed the, the toxicity data and said this start at the interim analysis and said this star is safe to proceed. Um, I can tell you, because I reviewed all the SAEs, we've only had one um, significant hematologic toxicity. I think your case of DIC came in, but they recovered. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we still don't have an explanation for that, but that was recorded. So our SAE rate's very low, and um, I don't think we've actually observed any of the significant hematologic toxicity that people are most concerned with, although outside of this, um, Dale might tell you as well, that we've had one case now of uh, AML slash MDS in our whole experience in the last six, seven years, whatever it is, um, in, uh, with PRT. And so the other point about why you wouldn't recruit to this, you've got to accept the equipoise that exists in a randomised trial such as this. And so unless you do that, you can't participate in the randomised trial. And so we think that there was sufficient equipoise around the questions and we feel perfect. And it's interesting that patients are prepared to travel from the ACT from Central Coast to go on the trial rather than given the choice of having treatment outside the trial because they equally felt um, got some interesting patient statements that we could, we could put together after this as part of the journey and the experience about why they were prepared to do this. So um, that's my answer. Nick. Oh, I'll ask you while I went. Um, so I probably referred uh, 20 patients for Lutate to three different centres of excellence and probably 50 courses of Lutate in total. And I could probably toss a coin as to whether they get capecitabine with the Lutate or not. And it fluctuates according to year on year, first course, second course, third course. Um, and so as an observer who is in the process but not calling the shots, I'm still confused about the place of capecitabine in this disease. So I commend you for this trial, but I wonder where the data is about capecitabine without so, um, the temozolomide. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Quickenboom did a study. I, I don't think it's been published. Sure, you may be able to correct me otherwise. So that, that did address the question with CAPE. I haven't seen the data. And we knew that was running when we started this, but we went to... We wanted to, to move forward from the uh, single arm phase two study that actually Harvey Turner had done. To your point, we had to write a protocol with Cancer Institute, a prospective observational study protocol with Cancer Institute New South Wales. And just through discussion, we felt we had to write it with capecitabine because that's what the common practice was accepting that we didn't actually have data to support that necessarily. We, within the protocol, have discretionary decision-making around if they, we're concerned about any aspects of the patient that may limit their uh, ability to tolerate the treatment where we can omit being not a formal study protocol, omit capecitabine, give them first round to see if they tolerate and add it. Um, and, and the reason we're doing that is because we have to be pragmatic. We're not going to be so rigid when you're trying to offer a patient a standard therapy. Um, so that's why we may make some individual choices around patients. Um, I can't, can't speak on behalf of the other centres.